So it's been a bizarre few weeks for the Labour Party. I think that really started with the Panorama investigation, which was last Monday. But I don't want to talk about that in particular in this video. I want to talk about more recent events which responded to it. I want to talk about um, this advert that was placed in The Guardian by 64 Labour Lords uh, yesterday, Wednesday. And in addition to that, there is a, a motion that's been submitted to the party's NEC by some people, including Tom Watson, in regards to anti-racism and auto-exclusion. I want to do another video at some point in regards to the question of whether or not the Labour Party is institutionally anti-Semitic. I don't think it is. I've written something about it. You can check that out at luxurycommunism.com. Trying to base that as much as possible on quantitative data, generalizable data and facts, rather than how one person feels or how one person doesn't. Obviously, if Panorama wanted to, they could make a documentary saying how everybody loves Jeremy Corbyn or Boris Johnson or Nigel Farage. It depends who you talk to. That's not scientific if you talk to a group of people because they may not be typical. I don't need to go into that for now. Topic for another video. Let's talk about these two big things, the advert and this motion that's uh, being submitted by Tom Watson. First with the advert, this was remarkable. I thought this was a real low point for The Guardian because it was 64 unelected or 67 I've seen in some places, 64 and others, but more than 60 uh, Labour lords, unelected peers who placed an advert in the paper which may have cost as much as £18,000 to attack the party's leader. This is quite remarkable. Unelected people attacking a twice elected leader of the opposition, the uh, you know one of the most important people in the country's democratic life, and nobody in the mainstream media is asking, where has the money come from? £18,000 is a lot of money. Where has that come from? The, the Guardian haven't made it clear. Who paid for it? I mean, clearly there's an important consideration there around who is funding an attack on the leader of the opposition to the tune of £18,000 and nobody's mentioning it or even asking the question. I think it says a lot about the state of the media in this country. Equally alarming is the fact that The Guardian is meant to be a progressive newspaper and yet it's allowing unelected legislators to attack an elected leader of the opposition through payment. Now... What this says to me is there's increasingly no real distinction between the paper's paid-for content and its editorial line. Let's say I could muster up £18,000 to uh, take out an advert and say that Jonathan Friedland, one of the editors at Comment It's Free, is an appalling journalist. I, mean, I don't actually happen to think that, I'm just being provocative, right? I think he's a pretty bad journalist, but whatever. I mean, it's immaterial. All that the editor is a bad person or whatever. Now, clearly, uh, The Guardian would say, well, we're not going to run that advert why? Well, they would say it's a code of conduct, etc. But clearly it's at odds with the editorial line of the paper. So if you can take out an advert attacking elected politicians, uh, but you can't take out an advert attacking people they happen to agree with or like, clearly, again, there's a bit of a breakdown there between paid for content and editorial. Big problem. Uh, and often we talk about Lebedev, the Evening Stand, the Telegraph. It seems to me The Guardian has just as big an issue here. Uh, very, very troubling. So who are these... Uh, lords, these uh, you know strident anti-racists. Well, let's look at the political complexion of them because I think you might be surprised, actually. Uh, the first is Margaret McDonough. She was the party's general secretary from 1998 to 2001. Uh, she proceeded to leave that position in 2001. She went to work for Richard Desmond, the Express newspaper group. Before leaving, she was most noted for taking a £100,000 donation to the party from Richard Desmond. Uh, of which only two people, including herself, knew about. So for all the talk of an independence complaints process and scrutiny and accountability and transparency, none of those words apply to her tenure as General Secretary. In fact, Lord Treesman, uh, her successor as General Secretary, was one of the people to really say as much. So she takes £100,000 from Richard Desmond, who at the time was the proprietor of the Express newspaper group, had titles like the Daily Express, the Daily Star, some of the most right-wing, racist, xenophobic papers in the country. She then goes to work for him. So you could say there's a conflict of interest. What really happened? Was it a quid pro quo? We don't know. It was 18 years ago. We'll probably never know. But this does clearly point to the fact there are obvious limits to her anti-racist credentials uh, to the extent that she took money from this gentleman and then went to work for him. Now, if you're not familiar with the politics of the Daily Star, the Daily Express, the Daily Star in 2011 came out for the English Defence League. Uh, Richard Desmond subsequent to giving that £100,000 to the Labour Party, has donated more than £1 million to the UK Independence Party. So it's pretty fair to say the guy's quite right-wing. Pretty right-wing. 
Yet she not only took this money from him for the Labour Party without barely anybody knowing, she then went to work for him and for these newspapers, which I would argue have reproduced some of the most objectionable, disgusting, racially inflammatory uh, rhetoric uh, this country has seen in my lifetime. But apparently she's an anti-racist. Interestingly enough, I wouldn't say McDonough is actually the worst case here. We have others. One is John Reid, former Labour Home Secretary uh, during the new Labour years. John Reid was arguably the most authoritarian Home Secretary ever. Now that's saying a lot when you consider that pretty much every Home Secretary during the, the Blair administration in particular was appalling. Uh, David Blunkett, awful man. Jack Straw, pretty bad. Charles Clark, very bad. I, I would say John Reid is the most authoritarian of those four. And that's really saying something. So why am I saying this? Well, while the advert claimed that the Corbyn leadership had failed to defend our party's anti-racist values, it was Reid who once announced he would target, quote, foreigners who come to this country illegitimately and steal our benefits. He also once boasted he was, quote, throwing out more asylum seekers, failed asylum seekers than ever before. And he even remarkably demanded that all immigrants from Africa be tested for HIV AIDS. That's right. He said that all immigrants just from Africa should be tested for HIV AIDS. Now, this is one of the brave anti-racists seeing down Jeremy Corbyn. Somehow, I don't think so. It gets even worse, believe it or not, because John Reid, in fact, went on a paid holiday to Geneva with one Radovan Karadzic in the early 1990s. Now, if that name sounds vaguely familiar, it's because he was responsible for the last major genocidal atrocity in Europe at Srebrenica, which saw the death and murder of thousands of Bosnian Muslims. Then there's Baroness Morgan, Sally Morgan to you and I. She was once a trusted advisor to Tony Blair. In fact, she was within an inner circle which consisted of just several people, Alistair Campbell, Blair himself, uh, and uh, Philip Gold his polling guru. Uh, and in fact, she was so trusted by Tony Blair that it was her, alongside Blair, who blocked the then Attorney General for giving the legal case for war in Iraq. That's right. She blocked the most senior lawyer, effectively, the Attorney General, from giving the legal advice as to why we should go to war in Iraq in 2003. So again, these people talk about independent complaints and, you know, rules and process she blocked a lawyer giving advice to the cabinet about whether or not war in Iraq was legal or not. That's because there were more holes in that argument than in a piece of Swiss cheese. These really aren't the people we should be looking to when we talk about probity in public office and upholding decent moral standards. Now, only days before that advert was published, five members of the party's NEC, including Tom Watson, submitted a motion that they wished to be adopted at party conference this autumn. That included the demand that racism, sexism, misogyny, homophobia and transphobia are dealt with by, quote, automatic exclusion from Labour, where there is, quote, irrefutable evidence. In an opportunistic ploy, typically bereft of considering actual implementation, it's unclear what irrefutable evidence is on planet Watson. Would Watson himself, for instance, be guilty of racism, given he oversaw a racist campaign in the Hodge Hill by-election in 2004? Now, I'm not making that up. We still have the leaflets and you can still read the kinds of rhetoric that was deployed. Read for yourself, because in one of those leaflets, that very campaign claimed that the Lib Dems want to keep giving welfare benefits to failed asylum seekers. They voted for this in Parliament on the 1st of March 2004. They want your money and mine to go to failed asylum seekers. We get it. You don't like failed asylum seekers. Now, what wasn't mentioned in this campaign was that the policy in question was Labour's plan to take asylum seekers' children away from them and forcibly place them into care. For defending such a brutal racist policy, deploying the most audible of dog whistles while doing so, what does Mr Watson think should be his comeuppance? And then there's the fact that Mr. Watson took a half a million pound political donation from Max Mosley. Mosley name sounds familiar. Yeah, that's right. He's the son of Oswald Mosley, leader of the Black Shirts, a fascist organisation. Now, I can hear what you're saying. Aaron, don't go there. You know, you can't uh, punish the son for the sins of the father, all that. Well, that's true, but also so is this. Max Mosley was the election agent in a campaign where a leaflet specifically claimed that people of colour were responsible for spreading tuberculosis. Remarkably, as recently as 2018, Mosley conceded that the leaflet was, quote, probably racist, but they had no cause to apologise. And what would Watson suggest for his various colleagues, both past and present? 
that's David Blunkett, who was Home Secretary from 2001 to 2004. He once claimed asylum seekers' children were swamping British schools. And then there's Jack Straw. Should he have been automatically expelled for overseeing the introduction of discriminatory visa policies for Roma people of Slovakian and Czech heritage in 2001? Or perhaps he could offer input regarding Phil Woolas. Ahead of the 2010 general election, the former MP's team spoke internally of, quote, needing to get the white vote angry. Such an impulse was the basis for a campaign so ridden with racially inflammatory lies that shortly after winning, two high court judges determined Woolas had acted unlawfully and called for a fresh election. Now, between Woolas winning that election and those judges making that decision, what do you think the Labour Party did to Woolas? What was his punishment? Auto exclusion? Censure? Ostracised? Did he lose the whip? No. He was promoted. And how do you think Tom Watson responded to his good old friend Phil Woolas suffering such an appalling outcome? Well, we know, because he was kind enough to write about it for Labour Uncut, with Watson going on record as saying that the judge's decision was one we will all regret, and that he had lost sleep thinking about poor old Phil Woolas. And what would Tom Watson make of Yarlswood Detention Centre? This was built and opened by the Labour Party in 2001. It hosted women who were refugees, people seeking asylum. 70% of the women there, according to one report in 2006, are the survivors of sexual assault. Many have gone on record as suffering sexual and racist abuse at the hands of guards. This is an institution which seems almost built to destroy and denigrate vulnerable women of colour, and it was created by the Labour Party. I find it particularly interesting that Mr Watson excuses the behaviour of Phil Wallace, is involved in a in an appalling by-election campaign in 2004, and has no problem, it seems, with Yarl's word, and yet he's talking about auto-exclusion for racist members of the Labour Party. Well, if we're talking about auto-exclusion, perhaps we might start with you. Now, to highlight the brazen double standards and hypocrisy at the heart of all of this, and I really do think that in the last week and a half, most normal people look at the Labour right and they go, this is crazy. What the hell are you doing? Boris Johnson's about to be prime minister. There's the story of Baroness Hater. Funny name, but not a funny story. She went on record as saying that the team around Jeremy Corbyn were analogous to Hitler's bunker in the final days of the Third Reich. But if you look at the Chakrabarti report, if you look at the IHRA, if you look at all of the norms and conventions the Labour Party is now meant to be following in regards to taking on anti-Semitism, her comments were not just unacceptable, but racist. That's because there are people of Jewish heritage in Jeremy Corbyn's inner circle. He has a few people within his team. He has a few further people in his kind of political retinue more broadly who aren't in uh, his direct employment, so to speak, in, in the leader of the opposition's office. So you're looking at four or five Jewish people this is relating to, and yet this Labour Lord can openly compare them to Nazis. Now, what's interesting is that if anybody on the left does this, they're immediately denigrated, attacked, this is appalling, they're racists, and yet the very same Labour MPs step forward, Jess Phillips and West Streeting, who say that we should never compare anybody to Nazis or Hitler, a rule I generally agree with, are the first to say that Baroness Hater has been taken out of context, misunderstood, this is a miscarriage of justice. But what it reveals fundamentally is that these are unserious people in a time when we need more serious politics than ever before. Brazen, double standards, mendacious, hypocritical. They're not worthy to lick Jeremy Corbyn's boots. Now, when it comes to reselection and trigger ballots, I often try to say I don't have an opinion on MPs who aren't representing me. That's because the whole idea of mandatory reselection is that it's mandatory. It should apply to Jeremy Corbyn as much as Tom Watson. Um, and it's down fundamentally to local members to determine who's best to represent them. That said, I would say if I was living in Jess Phillips' constituency or West Streetings and I was a member, I would absolutely be organised. Uh, I would absolutely be organising to ensure a trigger ballot, because they are really impeding right now, obstructing any possibility of a Labour government. And the country needs a Labour government, whether it's taking on the far right, defeating racism building much better public services, making houses affordable, increasing wages, sorting out the NHS, uh, dealing with Brexit. So much to do before we even talk about the longer term issues, climate systems breakdown, demographic aging, automation, making the most of these remarkable opportunities in the 21st century. These people are not interested in any of that. It's really sad, uh, but that's just, that's it. That's the fundamental truth of the matter. So like I say, if I was 
living and uh, was a Labour Party member in their constituencies, I'd absolutely want to get rid of them because they're not serious about dealing with these things. The conclusion for this, I guess, is that what all this feeds into from Panorama to these various letters being signed by people to this advert apathetic uh, that cost £18,000 to these unelected people to attack a twice-elected Labour leader to uh, Tom Watson's motion. What all these reflect is a deranged comprehension uh, that Jeremy Corbyn's not really going anywhere, and that if there was another leadership, and if there was another leadership election, uh, the Labour right would lose. The strategy, therefore, instead is to undermine him and erode support for him, uh, and really a cause of political death by a thousand cuts. That can't be allowed to happen primarily because there is going to be a general election likely this year. And as I've said, looking at the actions of Watson, looking at people now comparing Jeremy Corbyn to Hitler, uh, we can't have these people destroy the only opportunity we're going to have to create a socialist government, I think. And arguably it might never happen again. This is a really historic opportunity. There's a bifurcation going on. Do we have the politics of Farage and Trump? Or democratic socialism and right now these people who are apparently are socialists are doing their absolute level best to undermine the latter and here's the thing and i'll conclude with this whether it's west Reading, tom watson or jess phillips fundamentally given a choice of boris johnson leading the country or jeremy corbyn they'll take the former as long as that's the case people have to work their damned hardest to get rid of them as labor mps because we and the country deserve a whole lot better